Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today I want to talk about the post-war legacy of the FG-42. This was one of the classic German Wunderwaffe of World War II, so why didn't it see any use after the war? You know, we see Sturmgewehrs actually put into service in other countries, notably Yugoslavia, but you don't see anyone using FG-42s in the late 1940s and early 1950s, so why not? Let's start with a little bit of background context here. In the immediate aftermath of World War II, essentially every major combatant nation looked at its suite of small arms and decided that there were some severe shortcomings and everything needed to be changed. So you'll see this in uh, the newly forming NATO alliance with a desire to standardize on a single cartridge. The US wants to go to a more efficient, shorter cartridge. The US, of course, recognizes that, like, wow, we used the BAR as a squad automatic weapon, and that thing is now 50 plus years old, and we really need something newer and better. Uh, they wanted to improve the M1 Garand, make it a, a more practical rifle, a, you know, a better, more multi purpose rifle. Uh, you see this with a lot of countries, the French, the British, the Russians in particular, essentially saying, we're never doing one of those with bolt-action rifles again, let's come up with some sort of self-loading infantry rifle. You see an interest in uh, reduced power intermediate cartridges, the Russians again in particular will switch over their entire small arms uh, assortment to 7.62x39 shortly after World War II, so everybody wants to change. And German small arms are pretty much available to everybody to investigate, to look at. Uh, the intelligence bureaus of all the major Allied powers had captured various bits of uh, German small arms technology, and they were around to look at. So everyone had a chance to look at the FG-42, and there were a couple countries that actually started substantial development programs, or basic developmental programs that may not have led very far, but Almost everyone had something based on the FG-42. Now, the other thing that we have to consider before we can talk about who copied the FG-42 is, well, what makes an FG-42 an FG-42? What's special about this thing that people would copy? Because everyone wanted a semi-automatic or select fire infantry rifle, and most of them were gas operated, and that technically describes this thing. So what's unique here? Well, a couple things. First off, visually, obviously, we have the layout. The side-mounted magazine, sort of quasi-bullpup, format, which was done to reduce the overall length of the gun. The pro is the gun gets shorter because the magazine and the fire control group can uh, basically sit in the same space on the receiver. If you had a bottom mounted magazine, well, the trigger group and the magazine are both bottom mounted, so they can't be in the same place. That's one element. Um, the FG-42 is renowned for being controllable in fully automatic fire with a full power cartridge. The elements that allow it to have the, that characteristic are a couple things. It has this very unusual um, chamber design where the, the shoulder of the brass actually blows out forward, creates a bunch of extra friction during the firing process that delays the unlocking and opening up the bolt. I'll just throw it out there right now. That's something that essentially nobody copied. There are a couple of designs that use a similar sort of mechanism, but none of them in the you know, post-World War II shoulder rifle um, genre. Uh, the Kimball 30 caliber 30 carbine pistol is an example of that. Uh, the 25 ACP man automatic pistol is an example of something like that, but nobody copied that off the FG. Um, the FG-42 also has a pretty hefty spring buffer down in the buttstock. It actually works in two separate ways. The, the whole action can reciprocate very slightly into the buttstock, and there's a heavy spring buffer to absorb the last bit of impact of the bolt and carrier. Um, those are elements that were certainly reused elsewhere, but they're not particularly distinct to the FG-42. The internal mechanism that is most distinct to the FG-42 is how it uses a rotating bolt with a fire mechanism that allows it to fire from a closed bolt in semi-automatic and from an open bolt in full automatic. There are again a few other guns, like the Johnson uh, light machine gun, that have that functionality, but the way the FG does it is essentially by having the firing pin fixed to the bolt carrier, which is also the gas piston, and then sort of float inside the bolt. So when the when it chambers around in semi-auto and a close with a closed bolt, uh, the bolt rotates into battery, it locks in position, and the firing pin is held about half an inch back. When you pull the trigger, uh, the entire bolt carrier and op rod assembly jumps forward under spring pressure that half inch. It's holding the firing pin with it. 
the firing pin hits the cartridge and that fires. It's a system that was derived originally from uh, the Lewis gun, originally designed by a guy named McLean in the US. Um, that's the mechanism that the Germans used in the FG42. And that's a pretty distinctive system. So, um, really what we're looking at is where did that rotating bolt but firing pin on the op rod system go, and what about that, and the, the side mounted quasi bullpup design. Those are the elements that people would have been copying in the post-war years. So there are three prime examples of uh, guns derived from the FG42 that we're going to take a look at. And let's go from least successful to most. And so we'll start with the British. There was the EM1, uh, known as the Corsac, named after its designer. And I should point out, you guys are probably familiar with the EM2 rifle. There, just like the US had M everything and T everything designations, the British used EM as experimental model, and they had an EM1 rifle, which we are not talking about, and they had an EM1 light automatic gun, essentially a squad automatic or a light machine gun, something kind of equivalent in role to the FG42 or perhaps better, better compared to the BAR. It was intended to be sort of the, the organic squad support weapon, a a uh, machine gun capable of some sustained fire uh, that was integral to a squad of riflemen. So you didn't have to you know, bring up the support machine gun when the squad's moving. It has this organic fire capacity already within it. Now what the British did with, uh, what Corsac did with the EM-1, was he got rid of the, the quasi bullpup thing and made it a full bullpup. He actually put the magazine on the bottom behind the fire control group, and this would be part of what uh, developed into the EM-2 rifle that we know about from NATO trials, but not a direct uh, mechanical linkage because the Corsac EM-1 light automatic gun used essentially a straight up copy of the FG-42 bolt uh, mechanism. What it did change, however, is it swapped the gas piston from a long stroke gas piston, which essentially means the piston is attached to the bolt carrier and the whole thing slides all the way back more than the length of the cartridge, on the EM-1 they gave it a short stroke piston, which means the gas piston itself, the bit that moves, that's pushed by gas, uh, was just a short little sort of tap it um, in contact with the bolt carrier, and when it fires it gives enough energy for the bolt carrier to cycle all the way back. Um, think of this as the difference between an M1 Garand long stroke and an M1 carbine short stroke. So the British copy, copy, it's in many ways a copy, but not straight up copy, of the FG42 was a short stroke gas piston that used the same rotating bolt mechanism, uh, had a forward a full bullpup, forward mounted bipod. Two of them were built, only one of those was actually completed. It's a, well, there's only one of them around. It's a very scarce gun today. And if you would like to know more about it, well, Jonathan Ferguson has a whole chapter on the EM1 Corsac in his book, uh, Thornycroft 2 SA80 from Headstamp Publishing. Now, our second most successful copy of the FG42 was done by the Swiss, specifically Waffenfabrik Bern. This is, there are two primary uh, small arms manufacturers in Switzerland at this point. They were SIG and Waffenfabrik Bern. Uh, SIG, of course, ended up winning the competition and trials process to re-equip the Swiss Army with a semi-automatic rifle, replacing their K31 Schmidt-Rubin bolt actions. Uh, and the, the Swiss would end up going with a roller delayed system. It's kind of like a G3 on steroids. But during the, the competition and development process leading up to that, Bern developed a whole series of guns that are uh, also partial copies of the FG42. Now the Bern guns do copy the aesthetic. They are all quasi bullpup side mounted magazine. One of the things the Swiss did that the British didn't is they actually experimented with an intermediate cartridge. They had essentially their version of 8mm Kurtz, except it was in 7.5mm. And they were tinkering around with smaller, lighter versions of a gun like this as individual rifles. Uh, this pro development program ran through the early 1950s, so there are models from 1951 through about 1956. Of course the final adopted Swiss rifle was the Sturmgewehr 57. That gives you the end date to this development process. Um, towards the, the latter part of those trials it was definitively decided that they would use a full-size cartridge, the 7.5 Swiss cartridge, 7.5 by 55 and so the later burn guns are full-length cartridges, like the FG-42 was. Now they, uh, 
they get they keep some of the elements and they get rid of some of the elements. So they actually got rid of the rotating bolt system and they went to a tilting uh, wedge bolt lock. Uh, not quite a tilting bolt, but uh, just a standalone locking wedge that would tilt down into a locking recess. And then when the gas piston came backward, it would tilt the, the locking wedge up and allow the thing to cycle. So not quite a straight up copy because the FG used a rotating bolt, but the rest of the gas system is basically the same as the FG42. They also used a fire control mechanism that was only uh, closed bolt firing. It was semi-automatic or full, but only from the closed bolt. They got rid of the open bolt um, element. And they, but they still copied a lot of the elements of the FG42 fire control system. But my understanding is on some of those models there are actually FG42 parts that will directly interchange in the fire control system. So uh, there was much more development from the Swiss than there was from the British. Like I said, they did about five years of developmental prototypes iterating through a bunch of designs that you can see all clearly are from the same developmental family, but then they lose to the SIG rifle. Then we come to our third and definitively most successful copy slash adaptation of the FG42, and that is the United States. Uh, we of course got our hands on FG42s. A lot of uh, officers at Aberdeen Proving Grounds and elsewhere in the US development program, development world, uh, were quite interested in them. And the FG42 actually formed the basis for the very first gun that would eventually develop into the M60 general purpose machine gun. So the M60, you trace its evolution all the way back, you have the T44, uh, machine gun, which is straight up a second pattern FG42, just like that one, where they milled off the magazine well and they essentially Frankensteined an MG42 belt-fed top cover onto the side of the gun. Now, I've actually handled this prototype at Springfield Armory. It is incredibly awkward. You can't actually use it as a left-hander because there's like a belt feed tray that comes almost straight down the, the left side of the pistol grip. You can sort of use it as a right-hander, but it was very clearly a proof-of-concept model. It was never intended to be manufactured in, in mass production. It was just, hey, let's see if this weird idea works. Let's like stick the MG42 and the FG42 together and see what happens. Uh, they had to make a new buttstock to accommodate the top cover coming off the back of the action. It's a real clutch of a gun, and it's super cool because it's super cool when you recognize that that actually led to something not perfect, there are certainly problems with the M60, but the fundamental mechanism of the FG42, and in fact the fundamental feed mechanism of the MG42, are not the source of that gun's problems. So over the course of about 10 years of development, uh, that system morphed into the M60. Now during the course of that development, the gas system would change a bit. Uh, where the Swiss got rid of the open bolt side of the FG42, the Americans got rid of the closed bolt. So the M60 only fires from an open bolt, which simplifies some of the elements of the, the whole mechanism. Uh, they kept almost identically the rotating bolt to gas piston layout mechanism of the FG42. They changed the front end, where, it actually, where the gas comes off the barrel, where the Germans had a pretty standard long stroke gas piston, the M60 design integrated what's called a gas expansion and cutoff system, which is where the idea is, is the, the intention was essentially to make the gun uh, behave reliably and equally with different uh, qualities of ammo. So if you had underpowered or overpowered ammo, the gun would still act the same way. And they did that by having uh, the gas port led into an open gas chamber that as the, as the gas piston started moving backward, it would actually cut off the gas port uh, after a certain amount of travel. The idea is we will take the proper, you know, a, a uniform amount of gas every time, and then the gas, because it's hot and burning, will continue to expand and it will force the gas piston back with a uniform amount of pressure. So if we have overpressure ammunition, it'll open a little, that, that chamber will fill a little more quickly, and then it'll cut off, and ultimately you have the same amount of force acting backward on the system, and the rest of it just vents out the front. If you have underpowered ammo, the system has longer to fill up and will get the same, again, the same uniform amount of gas. So that mechanism went into the design of the M60. It is that, it's the poor design of that system, not intrinsic to that system itself, but the poor implementation of it in the M60 that led to a system that could accidentally be reassembled backwards and turn the gun into a single shot weapon. Oops. Um, not something that you can trace back to the FG. Um, and 
Uh, and then, of course, the receiver design of the M60 is a multi-part stamped. Uh, the intention is to be an expensive uh, sort of system. At any rate, uh, there are very, very clear ties between the FG42 and the M60. And in fact, it's interesting, there's almost, because the first development of the M60 was literally an FG42 second pattern gun, it really is the most direct lineage from the FG to a well, it's the only lineage of the FG42 to a fully uh, fully implemented, successful mass issue uh, post-war firearm. Now, there are a couple other countries that of course had an opportunity to look at the FG42s. Uh, the Russians had access to some, um, without any doubt. Unfortunately, I don't have any good information on what the Russians may have done developing the FG. I suspect they had their own design systems already in place, and they just looked at this, and they didn't see anything that they thought was really particularly applicable to what they needed. Um, the same is true of the French. The French had a, an expansive small arms program after World War II, and they had a bunch of different competing design bureaus, but none of them decided to work with this as a basis. So the French actually had a program largely based on German engineers from Mauser, but what they were developing was the roller-locked and roller-delayed systems, which didn't end up taking until those guys moved on to Spain. Um, the French also worked on direct, direct gas impingement systems, and they had a series of gas piston uh, designs as well. But none of the French design bureaus decided to take on the FG as a starting point. So um, that pretty well covers everybody. Like That's the Americans, the British, the French, the Russians on the Allied side, the Swiss, uh, one of the more significant neutral powers doing weapons development at this time. And as you can see, 60% of them, three out of the, the five that we're looking at here, uh, did in fact make some sort of attempt to develop the FG-42. So uh, only one of them was ultimately successful, and it was successful in a format that is ob not obviously related to the FG-42. If you didn't know about the background, you would never look at an M60 and recognize that it came from that. So one of the interesting elements of small arms evolution and design. Well, this one was a lot of fun to go through. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching.